Introduction and Chapter One of the Mystery of a Turkish Bath. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. The Mystery of a Turkish Bath by Rita. Introduction. Under the pseudonym Rita. E. M. Gollan wrote some seventy novels, of which this is one. It is a rather penetrating book about the supernatural. It starts off with a somewhat unusual situation, at least in literature, with a group of ladies in the Turkish bath of a large and luxurious hotel by the sea in England, the sort of hotel to which people go to be cured of illnesses on the recommendation of their doctors. It is some time in the late nineteenth century. An extraordinarily beautiful woman appears one day in the Turkish bath, and the women already in there are quite fascinated by her. But there is another guest in the hotel, a Colonel Estcourt, who, it turns out, had known this woman since childhood. Indeed, it had been expected that they would one day wed, but instead she had gone off and married an elderly but fabulously wealthy Russian prince. Various demonstrations of her occult powers make the guests, both men and women, realize that the beautiful princess is someone with very special gifts, which one or two of them would like to learn more about. But in the very process of the ensuing teach-in, more things happen than had been bargained for, and both the colonel and the princess end up lifeless. The mystery deepens. If you like this sort of thing, it is a very good novel, but if you are not happy to read about the occult, you should leave it severely alone. End of introduction. The Mystery of a Turkish Bath by Rita. Chapter 1. The First Room. I take them for rheumatic gout, said a slight, dark-haired woman to her neighbor, as she leant back in a low, lounging chair, and sipped some water an attendant had just brought her. You would not suppose I suffered from such a complaint, would you? And she held up a small arched foot, with a scarcely perceptible swelling in the larger joint. She laughed somewhat affectedly, and the neighbor, who was fat and coarse, and had decidedly gouty symptoms herself, looked at her with something of the contempt an invalid elephant might be supposed to bestow on a buzzing fly. You made that remark the last time you were here, she said. And I told you, if you suffered from a suppressed form of the disease, it would be all the worse for you. Much better for it to come out, my doctor says. There was no doubt about the disease having come out in the person of the speaker. It had come out in her face, which was brilliantly rubicund, in her hands and ankles and feet, which were a distressful spectacle of knobs and bumps of an exaggerated phrenological type perhaps also in her temper, which was fierce and fiery, as her complexion, as most of the frequenters of the baths knew, and the attendants also to their cost. The small dark lady, with the arched feet, lapsed into sulky silence, and let her eyes wander over the room to see if anyone she knew was there. The baths were of an extensive and sumptuous description, fitted up with almost oriental luxury and comfort and attached to a monster hotel, built by an enterprising company of speculators, at an English winter resort in Hampshire. The company had proudly hoped that lavish expenditure, a beautiful situation, and the disinterested recommendation of fashionable physicians, would induce English people to discover that there were spots and places in their own land as healthy and convenient as Auvergne or Wiesbaden, or the Riviera, but though the coast views were fine, and the scenery picturesque, and the monster hotel itself stood on a commanding eminence, surrounded by darkly beautiful pine woods, and was fitted up with every luxury of modern civilization, including every specimen of bath that human ingenuity had devised, the company looked blankly at the returns on their balance sheet, and one or two directors murmured audible complaints at special board meetings against the fashionable physicians who had not acted up to their promises, or proved deserving of the substantial bonus which had been more than hinted at as a reward for recommended patients. 
On this December morning, some half-dozen ladies of various ages and stability of person, and all suffering, in a greater or less degree, from various fashionable complaints, such as neuralgia, indigestion, rheumatism, or its aristocratic cousin, rheumatic gout, were in room number one of the Turkish bath. The female form is generally supposed to be divine, and poets and painters have, from time immemorial, rhapsodized over beauty unadorned. It is probable that such poets and painters have never been gratified by such a vision of feminine charms as room number one presented. Light and airy garments were certainly to be seen, but not forms. It was, of course, a question of taste, as to whether the fat women, or the thin women, looked the worst, probably the former, if one might judge by the two samples of the lady who had arched feet, and the lady who had gnaw. Both were staying at the hotel, and were respectively named Mrs. Masterman and Mrs. Ray Jefferson. Mrs. Masterman was a widow. Mrs. Ray Jefferson had a husband. He was an American, blessed with many dollars, amassed on the strength of an invention. When Mr. Jefferson spoke of the invention, people usually supposed it to be of a mechanical nature. As they became more familiar with him, they learned it was something chemical. No one quite knew what, but it became associated in their mind with vats and boilers, and large works somewhere down Boston Way. There could be no doubt of the excellence of the invention, because Mr. Ray Jefferson said it was known and used all over Europe, and its success was backed by dollars to an apparently unlimited extent. The inventor and his wife had sumptuous rooms, but they were not averse to mixing with their fellow man, or rather woman, for Mrs. Jefferson rejoiced in the possession of certain Parisian toilettes and was not selfish enough to keep them only for the eyes of her lord and master. She was grudgingly, but universally, acknowledged to be the best-dressed woman in the hotel, except, of course, when she was in the Turkish baths, which unfortunately reduced its frequenters to one level of apparelling, a garment which made up in simplicity for any lack of elegance. The shape was always the same, viz. short in the skirt, low in the neck and bare as to sleeves. The material was generally pink cotton, or white with a red border. Mrs. Jefferson was quite American enough to have notions on dress, more or less original and extravagant. Finding her companion was unusually silent this morning, she gave up her thoughts to the devising of a special toilette for the bath. These garments were so hideous, she told herself, that it was no wonder people looked such guys in them. Still, there was no reason why she should not have something chic and novel for herself, something which should arouse the envy of, and make the wearer appear quite different to, the other women. The choice of style was easy enough, something Grecian and artistic, but the material discomposed her. It was hardly possible to have a bath of this description without one's garment getting into a moist and clinging condition leaving alone the after-processes of shampooing, douche, and plunge. So silk or satin or woolen material was out of the question, and cotton was common, not to say vulgar. She knitted her brows with a vigour demanded by so absorbing a subject. The white headcloth fell off, and she felt that her fringe was all out of curl and lay straight on her forehead in most unbecoming fashion. That also would have to be considered in the question of costume. A headdress which should combine use and ornament. The idea of having only a wet white rag on one's head. No wonder people looked objects. Perhaps it would be better to coil the hair about the brow and have no fringe, or at least only a few loose locks that would look equally well, straight or curled. As Mrs. Ray Jefferson was taking all this trouble about her personal appearance, when that appearance would only gratify the sight of a few members of her own sex, who were generally too much taken up with their own ailments or complaints, to care what their fellow sufferers looked like, it shows the fallacy of a popular superstition that women only care to dress for men. Believe me, no, 
they dress for critics, the critics of their own sex, who with one contemptuous glance can sweep a toilette into insignificance, and make its wearer miserable, or by some envious approbation are reluctantly compelled to bestow on it the seal of success. Is it for men, think you, that those delicate nuances and tints and shades are harmonized and put together? Such a conceit is only pardonable in a set of beings who possess not the delicate faculty of detail, and who, with a limited knowledge of even cardinal colours, describe the graces and beauties of a toilette by saying the wearer had on something white, or something black, or something red. But it suited her down to the ground. A few misguided individuals have even been known to take refuge in the remark, made historic now by comic papers, that they never look under the table when asked what certain ladies had on. But this is trifling, and only applicable to dinner parties. Mrs. Ray Jefferson's thoughts had not prevented her from taking stock of the other inmates of the room. One or two were lying on couches, but most of them seemed to prefer the low, comfortable chairs, that were like rocking-chairs, without the rockers. No one spoke. They looked solemn and suffering, and appeared intent merely on the symptoms of distilled moisture on the visible portion of their persons. "'I think,' said Mrs. Jefferson, "'I shall go into the second room. I can stand some more heat.' She made the remark abstractedly, in the direction of her neighbour, who only looked at her in a bored and ill-tempered fashion, as befitted one who had gout without arched feet to display as compensation. "'You and I are the only hotel people here,' went on Mrs. Jefferson, as she took up the glass of water and the headcloth, preparatory to moving away. Then she laughed again as she looked at her companion's flushed countenance and generally distressed appearance. "'What a comfort,' she said, "'that we won't look quite such objects at dinner-time. I always find a bath improves my complexion, don't you?' Mrs. Masterson gave an impatient grunt. "'As if it mattered what one looks like in a bath,' she said. "'Do you Americans live in public all your lives?' You seem to be always thinking of your clothes or your looks." Mrs. Jefferson opened her lips to reply with suitable indignation, but the words were cut short by a gasp of astonishment, and lost themselves in one wondering, long-drawn monosyllable. My! The gouty sufferer also looked up, and in the direction of the doorway, and though she said nothing, her eyes expressed as much surprise as was compatible with a sluggish temperament, and a disposition to cavil at most things and persons that were presented to her notice. The object on which the two pairs of feminine eyes rested was only the figure of a woman standing between the thick oriental curtains that partitioned off the dressing from the shampooing and douche-rooms. A woman, but a woman so beautiful! that she held even her own sex dumb with admiration. She was tall, but not too tall for perfect grace, and slender, but with the slenderness of some young pictured goddess. She was dark, too, but with a pale clear skin that was more lovely than any dead blonde whiteness. And to crown her charms she had long, rippling hair of jet-black hue that was parted from her brow and fell like a veil to her delicate arched feet, and through which the serious, darkly glowing eyes looked straight at the wondering faces before her. The pause she made before entering was brief, but not so brief that every eye there had not scanned enviously and wonderingly her perfect beauty, from the clear-cut exquisite face and bare beautifully shaped arms, to the graceful ankles gleaming white as sculptured marble through the veiling hair. Mrs. Jefferson first recovered speech. "'Who is she?' she whispered eagerly. "'Not at our hotel, I think. Looks like a walking advertisement of a new hair restorer. She'd be a fortune to them if she'd have her photograph taken so.' 
The newcomer, meanwhile, advanced, and took one of the chairs near Mrs. Jefferson. That lady suffered strongly from the curiosity that is characteristic of her admirable nation. She reseated herself, for the purpose of studying the strange vision, and not being in the least degree afflicted with English reticence, she set the ball of conversation going by an immediate remark. "'Had any of these baths before?' The person addressed looked at her with grave and serious eyes. "'No,' she said, and her voice was singularly clear and sweet, but with something foreign in the slow accentuation of words. "'I only arrived at this hotel last night.' "'Oh,' said Mrs. Jefferson, "'is that so? I thought I hadn't seen you before.' "'Come for your health?' "'Yes,' said the stranger, accepting a glass of water from the attendant, who had just come forward. "'Not gout, I suppose,' suggested Mrs. Jefferson, conscious that there were arched feet in the world even more exquisite in shape and size than her own. "'Gout! Oh, no!' said the stranger, smiling faintly. They say my nerves are not strong. I sleep badly. I am easily startled, and easily fatigued. She paused a moment, and one delicate hand, glittering with rings, pushed back the dark weight of rippling hair from her brow. I have had a great mental shock, she said quietly. Such things require time. One cannot easily forget. Her eyes had grown dreamy and abstracted. The hand that had pushed back her heavy hair fell on her lap. She looked at it in its shining rings, and Mrs. Jefferson's sharp glance followed hers. Was there a plain gold circlet among that glittering array? Was the beautiful stranger wife or maiden? If any man saw her now— she thought involuntarily. My, I wouldn't give much for his peace of mind afterwards. What owls she makes us all look! Nerves are queer things, she said aloud. Can't say I'm much troubled with them, except here, and she moved her foot explanatorily. Just that joint. It's agony sometimes. Suppressed gout, you know. You wouldn't think so to look at it, would you? that the gout was suppressed? Certainly I should, answered the stranger, smiling. There is no external sign of it. I always thought gout meant large lumps and swellings of the joints. So it does, said Mrs. Jefferson, with an involuntary glance at the moist and crimson sufferer on her right. But my form of it is different. It is much worse, but no one sympathizes with me because it doesn't look so bad as the other gout. It is not often that people do sympathize with illness, said the beautiful woman. When we ourselves are well, we think suffering can't be so very great after all. And when we are ill, we are quite sure no one else has to bear so much pain. Human nature is essentially selfish. It is a natural incident of living at all that we should estimate our own life as more important than our neighbor's. Well, laughed Mrs. Jefferson, if we sacrificed it to them, it might be a doubtful benefit. I often thank my stars I wasn't born in the age of martyrs. If I had been, I'm sure the very sight of the rack or the faggot would have made me swear anything. The history of religions is a very curious history, said the stranger in her low, clear tones. Looked at dispassionately, it has done very little for mankind in general, save to prove one fundamental truth that is more significant than any doctrine or dogma. That truth is the inherent need in all humanity of something to worship. 
from the highest to the lowest degrees of civilization that need has made itself the exponent of external forms. It is the kernel of all religions. A kernel that is surrounded with a very hard shell, said Mrs. Jefferson glibly. She liked discussions, and was accustomed to say she could talk on any subject, having indeed come from a country where women did talk on any subject, whether they were acquainted with it or not. "'I don't think there is much spirituality in any modern religion,' she went on. "'I surmise it's dead. Science has got the upper hand of theology, and means to keep it. People are not content nowadays with being told, "'You must believe so-and-so.' They want a reason for believing. You're not a Romanist, are you? she added, suddenly. I? Oh, no, said the stranger, with a faint smile. I'm glad of that, for I was just going to say that the Church of Rome has done more to retard rational and spiritual progress than any other. I don't believe in the voice of man barring the way to inquiry. God made man, and as far as I have ever been able to learn, he made them all on one pattern. The offices and dignities they give themselves won't make them one whit greater or more important, in his eyes. "'You are a Democrat, I see,' said the beautiful woman, looking gravely and scrutinizingly at the eager flushed face, with its ruffled damp curls and quick restless eyes. "'Well,' said Mrs. Jefferson, I don't exactly know what I am. My views are liberal on most subjects. I've travelled a good bit, and I think that enlarges the mind. I've just run over to have a look at England. Our people are laughing at her pretty well. The Gladstone party have made a lovely hash of affairs, haven't they? But perhaps you don't care for politics, being foreign. Oh, yes, I do, answered her strange companion. "'And I am specially interested in English politics,' she added. "'Like yourself, I was curious to see a nation who seemed determined to court their own shame, "'and to deify the being whose career is signally marked by obloquy and disaster. "'His day is pretty well over, I fancy,' said Mrs. Jefferson, "'eagerly scenting an opportunity for a brilliant display of political knowledge.' That Irish business has settled him. They call him the greatest statesman of the age. A man at dinner last night was lauding him up to the skies. There was quite a battle about him. We showed, however, that, putting his talking powers aside, he really is no statesman, only a grasping, selfish old bungler, who cares nothing for his country except it keeps him in office, and has done nothing really great or good during his whole career. They make a fuss about the Education Act, but the credit of passing that belongs to Foster. As for the disestablishment of the Irish Church, that is a disgraceful business, a robbery of the dead who had left their money to support a faith they believed in. He is responsible, to my thinking, for all the anarchy, confusion, and misery in that poor unhappy Ireland. I believe, and she leant forward and dropped her voice, I believe that at heart the man is more than half a Romanist. See how he has favoured the high church party, and if ever he gives a clerical appointment, it is always to a ritualist priest. They don't call themselves clergymen now. Well, and she drew herself up once more, I, for one, wouldn't like to have his sins on my shoulders. I should think he ought to be haunted by as many victims as Napoleon Bonaparte. What with financial humbug, war taxes, the blunders of the Alabama business, the disgrace and bloodshed of the Transvaal affair, and the Egyptian war, crowned by the undying and never-to-be-forgotten shame of Gordon's sacrificed life, I wonder he can lay down his head at night and sleep. When he heard of that hero Gordon's death, he should have taken a pistol and blown out his blundering brains. But perhaps— she added more calmly. He was afraid of meeting his victims until he couldn't help himself. However, he might have gone into one of those retreats his favourite ritualists are so fond of, and spared England any more blunders and follies. 
"'You are very bitter against him,' said the stranger calmly. "'Be sure that his own actions will also be his own avengers. "'Life would be made much more tolerable "'if we would only keep that fact before us. "'To my mind there is no backbone or support in a religion "'that teaches irresponsibility. "'That is the great fault of you Christians. "'Your faith is not a thing you take hold of "'and grasp and act upon.' hence your many national disasters. You shelve your future, or what you call your salvation, on the merits of a sacrifice, and think yourselves relieved of all further trouble. In the world, and in society, religion is a tabooed subject. It is only kept for Sundays and for churches. I believe your clergy know no more of the real doctrines of Christianity those deep and mystical truths underlying the teachings of Christ, than the child at his mother's knee. I have been to your great cathedrals and churches. I saw only lip service and routine. I heard only stale maxims, weak explanations of the allegories and parables that fill your biblical records, flowing rhetoric and vague expressions of some undefinable joy and glory in an equally undefinable hereafter, that was sometimes described as a place and sometimes as a state. That was all. I feel such things cannot long stand against the tide of advancing thought. Modern Christianity is not the Sermon on the Mount and has little title to the name of its founder. It has not a feather's weight of importance in the minds of the worldly, the fashionable, the pleasure-seeking. Its sentiment is extinct, save in a few faithful ignorant hearts, who adore what they cannot comprehend, and live in a state of hope that all will come right in some vague future." The beautiful eyes had grown sad and thoughtful. They rested on the eager, wondering face before her, yet seemed to look through and beyond it, as the eyes of one who sees a vision that is mere airy nothingness to the surrounding crowd. "'It will come right,' she went on slowly and dreamily, "'but not as men think, and not because the religion of earth teaches fear of punishment.' and hope of reward as the basis of spiritual faith. No, something higher and holier and deeper than any motive of self-safety will perfect what is best in man and eliminate what is vile. If that is so, interposed Mrs. Jefferson glibly, as she rose from her chair to proceed to the second room, I guess man will want a pretty long time to perfect in. I don't see how he's going to do it here. I did not say here, answered the stranger in her slow, calm way, as she too rose and prepared to follow the little American. For what, think you, are the ages of eternity intended? Sleep and dreams? Mrs. Jefferson gave a little shudder. I surmise we're getting a little too deep, she said. Let's keep to Gladstone and the Irish question while the thermometer's at a hundred and ten. End of chapter one.